Beyond the Fence Line, a podcast brought to you by the Texas Agricultural Land Trust. Created by landowners for landowners, we're proud to play a role in conserving the Texas legacy of wide open spaces. Well, I want to welcome everybody to Beyond the Fence Line. I think we have a great, um, great topic today and, and that we're going to discuss. And it's, you know, it's a topic where we think about it from a land steward perspective is uh, you know, where's the start? Where's the, you know, where's the science behind everything? And, you know, where are the gaps? And we have a, you know, one of my dear best friends with us and, and definitely the expert in this, in this field is uh, Mr. Jeff Goodwin with the Noble Research Institute. Uh, welcome, Jeff, and thanks for joining us. Chad, honored to be with you today and uh, looking forward to the discussion. Well, yeah, I'm, you know, uh, you know, Jeff and I go way, way back and 20 plus years working together. And, uh, you know, this is exciting topic to me is, is, you know, you and I've been talking about this for, for many years and brainstorming. And, you know, I was sitting last night, Jeff, thinking about and reflecting, you know, the, you know, we've really have made an impact and, and it, it, it doesn't seem like we have and they're little impacts, but all those little impacts you know, build upon. And I think things are aligning more and, and I'm looking forward to the discussion to really deep dive into this, you know, a little bit deeper. Um, you know, I think, Jeff, I mean, how about you just kind of start off and just give us a little background from yourself and maybe a little, um, you know, introduction about Noble Research Institute. Yeah, um, so, Jeff Goodwin, uh, I, I serve as a senior range and pasture consultant with Noble Research Institute. Um, been at Noble for about six years, um, or almost six years now. Um, prior to that, I, I worked 14 years for the, the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service, most recently as the state range specialist. Um, <clears throat> I came to Noble in 2016. Um, and you know, there we, we focus on providing solutions to producers. Um, we're, we're really uh, uniquely positioned, I feel, as one of the largest nonprofit research organizations in, in the U.S. As, and the, in that, we, we provide direct consultation to producers. We also provide uh, education and outreach. But more importantly, we do that on a foundation of research that we conduct ourselves there uh, and in collaboration with the many partners uh, that we work with and all three of those facets of research consultation and education. And so um, Noble has been around since 1945. Uh, it was founded by Lloyd Noble uh, in, in, in the late 40s or mid 40s, really, uh, as an organization to look at the soil to help producers in the area of the Southern Great Plains. Uh, we're located in Ardmore, so halfway between Oklahoma City and, and, uh, and uh, Dallas-Fort Worth area, really to, to focus on some of those ideas of, of, of how, do we, how, do we, how do we build soil? How do, we, how do we conserve soil? How do we save it? How do we help producers to better understand management practices to uh, or really, we've we've moved beyond practices, to be honest with you, and I, maybe I'll get into that a little bit. But we're really focusing on these core principles, focused on the uh, the building of these ecosystems, processes, and and it, it's really a, a an investigation into the whole. Really, uh, you, you can't look at it uh, through a microscope anymore uh, and look at one little piece. But from from Noble's perspective. Um, we, we've made a transition um, in 2017, I believe, we transitioned from the Noble Foundation, Samuel Roberts Noble Foundation to the Noble Research Institute. It, it put us, uh, it, it provided us an opportunity to transition into an ag research organization, ARO, um, which, which gave us some, some, some further opportunities, but one of the biggest transitions we've made recently or, or focuses primarily is this er in the area of regenerative grazing land production uh, with a focus on uh, producer profitability. So 
Uh, we're, we're really diving into this area with both feet. Uh, all of our research, our education and outreach is gonna be focused in those areas and, and we're, we're pretty excited to, to move forward. Great, thanks Jeff. You know, um, you know, we work, you know, we worked together 20 years with, uh, you know, back with NRCS and then we worked together again at Noble. And, um, you know, we've always been a focused about what you're, you're, what you're talking about and what we're gonna discuss today. You know, when I came to Texas Agricultural Land Trust, they had started a policy paper, um, you know, kind of looking at, um, you know, creating real resilient landscapes, right? And, and the things you're talking about and, you know, and how the critical role of our working lands um, is to changing this climate and, and to our changing climate, you know, and, and you know, I never want to get into discussion and debates about, you know, what caused climate change or any of those things. But, you know, the key piece is that, uh, you know, our private land stewards are solutions to the issue, right? And I think we can all understand and know that we're seeing, you know, um, more impact or, you know, more intense uh, weather events, right? We, we had a, you know, a tremendous winter storm, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we've had these extreme droughts, we see these extreme floods, and it's really about creating these resilient landscapes to handle that. And I think the most important part of it is it's important to stay in business, right? And, and I think as a whole, in a community as a whole, uh, we forget that, you know, those land stewards are not only taking care of that land, but they're, they're trying to, you know, feed their family and, and they're running an operation in a business. And, uh, you know, I think that's, that's a key component to this that we lose that context a lot of times when we get into, you know, talking about policy and things of that nature. Uh, so we built this resilient landscape policy paper to really give us direction and help. And, and uh, you know, we really kind of came back and kind of the nuts and bolts is it gives us areas of trying to build more tools to help empower the producer, right? To be better tomorrow than they are today. And we really came down to this final aspect of our policy statement, which I think Jeff, uh, I'll read this to you and I think it'll resonate to you. And that TALT recognizes the critical role of landowners and working lands in maintaining, creating and fostering resilient landscapes that mitigate the impact of a changing climate. Resilient landscapes are rural working lands that are managed for optimal soil health, water quality and availability, biodiversity, wildlife habitat, and other ecosystem services while meeting the financial and quality of life needs of the agricultural operator. And I think that, you know, really defines what we're doing and, and appreciate, you know, all the years and all the work you and I appreciate Noble Research Institute of trying to find those solutions and, and help find solutions for these producers on the ground. Um, you know, I know you're, you know, you're, when we think about resilient landscapes, uh, you know, I think a lot of times we get focused, you know, singular or, or you know, in uh, silos and we don't think about it, you know, as a whole, right? And, and ecology and all these things are, are very messy and they're complicated and uh, really would love Jeff to kind of hear your thoughts on you know how do we tackle and build more resilient landscapes and you know what does this really mean right we we hear a lot of buzzwords we hear a lot of things but you know let's kind of get you know move the noise out and get to the bottom line and uh, what are your thoughts well <clears throat> I think that's a uh... I think it's a great topic of discussion and, and one that I know you and I care deeply about and so does every other uh, you know, producer in, in the state of Texas. And, you know, I think a lot of this, um, a lot of this is driven by, by how, we, how we perceive the land. How do we, how do we, what is our perception? Our perception then drives uh, what we see. And so if we perceive our land as, as property, um, it is property, but if we perceive it just as property, I think that's, that's, that's a viewpoint that, that, that lacks a bit of depth. If we look at it 
from the perspective of, of land or an ecosystem. If you're, you, you, I know you remember Aldo Leopold once defined land as the culmination, right, of, of the soil, the water, the plants, the animals. He collectively referred to that as land. And as, as we look at, at land in that context, then we, then we start to see uh, a bigger picture. And I think all too often we focus on uh, when we try to, to address uh, whether it's a, a resource concern or, or a, a problem or a, we often are so focused on the symptoms because the symptoms are what we see in front of us that we miss the idea of going back and really addressing what the root core problem might be. And so focusing on kind of the a reductionist train of thought where we focus on these little singular instances in time and space has driven us to only see those things. So I often refer to, uh, you know, the, the great ecologist John Muir that said, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. So we have to approach our view of, of these rangelands, grazing lands, pastures, croplands, it doesn't matter, it's really land use agnostic to, to, to really begin to think about the whole. How is what we do, uh, how are the, the impacts that we make on a piece of property? How are they negatively or positively impacting these these ecosystem processes that are driving the train. We've got four of them, the, the energy cycle, the water cycle, the nutrient cycle, and, and this idea of community dynamics or plant community dynamics. So when we, when we start to understand how we impact the energy cycle, meaning are we, are we, do we have the ability to take the most powerful source of energy on planet earth, the sun, and convert that into sugars and starches through this process of photosynthesis with plants and then have the ability as managers to convert that into a, a protein that, that people enjoy uh, through livestock production. Um, how we do that matters. Um, effects on the water cycle, we can get into that, nutrient cycling, all, all those, the, the point there is that the ecosystem processes, our ability to see what our management is applying to that landscape is, is going to be pretty important for us to move forward, to be able to, to understand the impacts, positively and negatively, of how we manage that land that we refer to. So I think, I think as we step back, um, and look at it, we have to look, we, we have to look at it's, it's, it's very, uh, it ties well to your podcast name, we have to look beyond the fence, we have to look at, uh, we have to look at how what we do on our ranch impacts a growing urban community. Um, I think this idea of ecosystem services, uh, what we provide on these landscapes is hugely important. Um, we can get into that a little bit later, but to me, that's my viewpoint of how we need to be looking at if we're gonna uh, if we're gonna really set the stage to be resilient. We have to be able to see what we're working with. Yeah, I think that's great, Jeff. You know, one of the things that popped in my mind was you know another Aldo Leopold quote, right? Is you know the the one where he says you know we abuse land because we see it as a commodity belonging to us, right? But when we see the land as a community to which we belong, you know, we begin to use it with love and respect. And it, it you know, it really defines of everything you've said there. You know, and we kind of look, I think, too, Jeff, is, is you know, you know, we get to this stage, we only know what we know. And there's, you know, there's huge gaps and there's this unknown, right? And, and you know, I remember us, you know, at Noble talking about, you know, we, we know more, um, we know more about stars and space than we do actually the soil, which is the foundation, right, to our, to our landscapes. And, um, and really trying to understand that cornerstone of the, resi you know, this resilient landscapes really starts with that foundation of the soil and, you know, how it's healthy lands really protect, you know, 
the uh, biodiversity, it protects the community, as you said, beyond the fence line, all of those things. And I know you and, and Noble, you know, are, are really taking on this challenge and, you know, with other, with many other partners and I, you know, my hats off to you guys. And, and these, are, these are huge challenges, but I really want to hear from you of, you know, what are those challenges? What, you know, what are those gaps? What do we need to learn? And then once, you know, we gather that science and understanding, what does that mean to producers across the country? Yeah, I appreciate that. that. So when we get into this idea of, of what, what do we know, um, what do we know, what, 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 what research type questions can we begin to ask? Man, the, the, the opportunity really uh, opens. You know, we, we've done a lot of work in the, in the rangeland discipline, uh, several disciplines have over the, over the number of years. Um, from the soils perspective, its interaction with plant communities and, and how all these things work together. Um, we've largely not focused, however, in the last 10 or 15 years on the, on the biology in the soil. We focused on the physical characteristics. We understand the chemical characteristics of soil, but it is a new frontier when we start talking about soil microbiology and what role they play in in affecting what the energy cycle, the water cycle, uh, their ability to help soils aggregate and things like that to in, increase infiltration and water holding capacity. And we're really just learning uh, some of those things. And, you know, it's sometimes when we get into this area of soil health, we, we get bombarded by metrics. You know, we've got 90 something metrics out there that that people are looking at. And to, so to me, I think wading through some of that is important. Um, I, I kind of like to, to frame uh, some of the research that we're gonna be focusing on no, no, uh, at Noble around this idea of the three Ms, uh, metrics, management, and monitoring. And so what I mean by that is what metrics matter, what metrics will inform us the most, um, how is our management affecting or impacting those metrics? And then at what scales do we or can we monitor those metrics that are relative to producers? And so, so I want to be able to, we know that, you know, a, a, an individual with a shovel is not going to scale, right? So we need technologies like remote sensing, like uh, utilizing uh, various forms of, of technology to be able to better understand what's happening at the site, then what's happening at the, at, the, at the ranch scale, what's happening at the watershed scale, the state scale. As we begin to scale this out, scale our understanding, we've got to have better tools to be able to do that. And so that's one of our, been one of our focuses lately. We've got a, a substantial research project started looking at uh, the impact of grazing on, uh, on a lot of this, uh, a lot of these ecological uh, sort of contextual parameters. So we're looking at, um, we'll be looking at everything from soil carbon and there it, soil carbon's dynamics, uh, even through uh, soil carbon flux uh, through the atmosphere, um, looking at other soil dynamic properties, uh, soil infiltration rates, things of that nature, the, to, to really discern the metrics that, that can provide the greatest amount of information back to producers so they can make informed decisions. That's what, I, that's what Noble feels uh, research should do is we should directly uh, be able to provide producers that, that informative science-based information information to help them answer questions and, and make decisions. If it's not doing that, we're probably not going to be uh, too interested in, in doing the research on it. Um, but I, I feel like I feel like this is a really key area for us to focus on. Also, you know, when we get into just to kind of stay on the soil topic for a minute, when we when we start talking about carbon, Sometimes uh, we we chase rabbits or 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 
you know, someone that really isn't in this uh, real deep might confuse carbon. Like, what are you talking about? Are you talking about CO2 in the atmosphere? Are you talking about carbon in other forms? What, what do you mean? And, and carbon is in a number of different forms, um, as you well know. And, and so when we talk about carbon, most people think about the carbon in the atmosphere or they think about the carbon in the vegetation. So the rainforest, the prairies. Um, but when we step back and look about, look about where uh, from the, on the terrestrial part of our planet, where the carbon is plus the atmosphere, there's about 750 petagrams of carbon in the atmosphere. That's about uh, one petagram is a billion tons. So there's 750 billion tons of carbon in the atmosphere. There's 580 billion tons of carbon in the vegetation on planet Earth. There's almost 1,500 petagrams of carbon in the first meter of soil. And so there's, there's, more, there's more carbon in the top meter of soil on planet Earth than there is in the vegetation and the atmosphere combined. And so as land managers, where do we have our greatest impact? we have our greatest impact on that top three feet of the soils uh, of the soil surface. If we go to two meters, it's 2,500 billion tons of soil, and we can impact the top two meters with our practices. So um, there's places where the first meter that we're working with now is not the meter that we worked with 50 years ago because of erosion. So there's a tremendous amount of, of opportunity there. Um, the trouble with soil carbon is uh, there's difficulty. There's there's difficulty with variability um, as far as the the landscape uh, and uncertainty uh, from a temporal perspective of how long that carbon is there, whether it's labile carbon or if it's 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 uh, you know if, we, if we've got it there for the long term. But the idea is is really focused around our opportunity to sequester carbon on, on grazing lands particularly. Um, I think we've got, a, we've got a, a tremendous opportunity ahead of us and it's really focusing on getting more organic material, more organic matter back in the soil. Organic matter is 58% soil carbon. So as we increase soil organic matter in our soils, we're sequestering more carbon and those cascading effects that come along with increasing organic matter, um, Organic matter also is the, uh, particularly the food, uh, a food source for soil microbes. Um, those microbes are also utilizing the sugars and sugars that are being leaked out of plant roots. And so the combination of that, um, they, the bacteria, soil mycorrhizal fungi, they're all providing these benefits in a symbiotic relationship with plants to help them aggregate soils. And when we aggregate soils, they tend to uh, create more pore space, which increases our rate of infiltration, uh, potentially our water holding capacity. And that's what really leads us to a resilient landscape is getting the, the soil working again. Right. I mean, I, it, it, it just impacts so many things, right? And, you know, maybe dive in a little bit of that connectivity, right? If back to the whole and, and back to these ecological principles, Jeff, of you know how the soil relates to the plant community. What does that plant community look like, and you know so forth to to our habit, wildlife habitat and things. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I think the soil is the foundation of of everything that we do in in agriculture. And if if the soil is not working, then largely we're we're either applying some kind of a synthetic input to meet a yield goal, or it's, it's working to the point where we can reduce our dependency on a lot of those inputs. I, I think, uh, you know, everybody remembers the Dust Bowl. You know, it, it, um, it, it I mean, we weren't, we weren't around then, but we certainly remember the acid, and we can still see some of the scars from it. Um, and that was largely because we didn't necessarily know uh, the negative cascading impacts of, of what we were applying on the land. We certainly have learned since then. Um, and we've, we've you, know, you, you asked the question, what do we really know today? 
Um, there's a lot of science that's been done, but we know that there's some principles that work. There, we know that there are some principles that work uh, on the ag, uh, whether, whether it's cropland, whether it's grazing lands, rangelands. Um, these, these soil health principles really begin to, to codify and bring all, all of these, uh, these actions together. So uh, just running through them quickly, keeping the ground covered is really important. So tying in, tying in uh, the covering the, the planet, right? Mother Nature does not like bare ground. And anytime there is bare ground, we have early successional plants that begin to come back. And bare ground is really enemy number one in a lot of these cases because um, not only it does that ground cover help from a uh, and, and, uh, our ability to build organic material and organic matter, but it's also a temperature mitigation effect. So when you think about uh, 110 degrees or 105 degrees in the summer in Lone, Texas, and you have bare ground, it can be 140 degrees at the soil temperature on bare ground. It can be, there can be 30, 40, sometimes pushing more than 40 degree temperature gradient differences on a well covered soil versus a soil that, that, is, that is bare. And, and once we get to that 140 degree, our soil biology is, is either completely stopped or dying. And that's why we cook our hamburgers to 140 degrees, by the way. <laughs> so, uh, you know, as we, as we move through those, uh, increasing diversity is, is certainly a, a one that, 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 is, that is extremely important. And I'm not just talking about um, plant species, plant species diversity begets more uh, biological diversity. We get increased wildlife habitat benefits and biodiversity benefits from that. But but diversity is really key. Um, it, it's a it's different plants exude different biology or, or different exudates, and they attract different bio, biological communities. Um, Plant uh, minimizing unnatural disturbances is also another principle that 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 we try to follow. And when I say unnatural disturbances, um, I, you know I, I'm talking about synthetics. Um, natural a natural disturbance would be grazing. We don't want to minimize that. We want to optimize it. Um, uh, a grazing event on a plant is a disturbance, but those plants are dependent upon uh, infrequent disturbances to be able to sustain themselves. So it's certainly one, a disturbance that those plants evolved with. We want to continue to manage that. Fire is another one. Um, that's certainly a needed natural disturbance in our, our on our rangelands, uh, especially in Texas. We can see the we can see the symptoms of that natural disturbance being taken off of our landscape with the with the woody encroachment that we see in the state. Um, keeping a live root in the ground is important. Uh, those, the biology need to be functioning at a high level. They function with live plant roots first. So if there isn't a live root in the ground, then they'll be either dormant or utilizing some other source of organic material. We don't want them doing that. Um, and then largely integrating, properly integrating livestock in our systems. Um, you know, you've got a grazing background, you know well the, the benefits of a good uh, grazing plan and and understanding uh, the, the impacts that that can have. The last principle there is really context, and it's it's working with those principles in each individual producer's context, in their uh, in their ecological context, whether that be in Texas or Idaho or uh, Midland versus Brownsville. Um, what is their ecological context, and how can they apply those to best meet their goal and objectives? There's also uh, socioeconomic context. So what, what, what benefits that person's quality of life? Um, what, are their, what are their economic goals? I think for too long in agriculture, we've siloed ecology and economics. And uh, sometimes we focused it on economics to the detriment of ecology. And other times we focused on ecology to the detriment of economics. And so we really need to talk about those as part of the whole too. Um, we, can't, we can't continue to move those out into separate buckets and, 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 and really say that we're working the system as a whole. 
Yeah, I mean, I think, unfortunately, there's not the big red easy button, right, in the middle of the room. I mean, these, the, and you've articulated it very well, the complexity of not only the complexity of our land, but, but the complexity of, you know, managing that land, the complexity just our, ourselves, right, and, and how, how it affects us and our lives and, and our goals and objectives. And, um, you know, and I think one thing, Jeff, and is, you know, it's, it's the value of our grazing lands, right? I, I think from a whole, you know, we've, we've, you know, and I think some of it's just a disconnect and, you know, we have less and less folks connected to the land, to agriculture, and we don't appreciate or, or truly understand the value of our grazing lands and what these grazing lands provide, right? What I call beyond the fence line of those ecosystem services of clean, wa clean water, clean air, open space. You know, we can go on and on of, of, of all of these other factors that, that come from these grazing lands and the, and the stewards that manage those lands. You know, and I, I think we look at the context today, and, or, you know, we look at the landscape, I, I, I would say today, I think we're at a point where we have more and more people wanting to um, know where their food comes from, wanting to know more, you know, on the land management and, and the things that you talked about, even though they may not be a, a land manager, those things are important to them and they're interested. And, and I think we look at today on, uh, you know, uh, our administration today, they're, they're looking at these things. And I think it's extremely, extremely important for the landowner to be at the table and to discuss and to talk through these things through our lens. And I guess my big question is how do we do that? And any thoughts around that? Well, in a state like Texas, if landowners aren't at the table, I don't believe that we're going to get very far. Um, you know, we're 95% we're privately owned in the state of Texas. Um, so so having, having landowner engagement in, in processes and even policy development is, is to me, is, it's critical. And when we, when we start to think about value, um, I, th I think you uh, picked a, up a good point there. We often look at value um, as monetary in, 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 in the case right. of agriculture. So we look at the value of our land, how much is it worth? Uh, we, look at, we look at the services that, that a landscape typically provides. And, and the trouble is producers have only been really paid for the services that are being provided off of a, off of a property or piece of land uh, for food and fiber for hundreds and even thousands of years, we've been paid for the food that's produced or the fiber that's produced, and and yet we're as producers we're producing much more uh, or many more services to a, a growing public, but it's really our job to be able to, to define and quantify for them what those services are. And we're talking about things like soil carbon sequestration and our opportunity to take carbon from the atmosphere, convert that carbon through a pl living plant and sequester it into the soil. Um, that is one service that we provide to society as a whole that, that I think we need to work, we, we need to continue to work on to, to quantify um, and move away from the any any concerns with uncertainty. Um, I, I think there are a lot of areas that are interested in that. Uh, there's a lot of groups working on it. Um, I think the new administration will likely uh, be interested. They've already expressed as much as it, it looking at it a little further, but I, I really think that this is an opportunity for voluntary private solutions. Private market solutions is where I think we probably eat, that's where the it's where the the tide is going uh it's where a lot of these groups like the ecosystem service market consortium is going um but i think we can't you know that the elephant in the room as far as ecosystem services has always been carbon because it's tied back to uh greenhouse gas emissions um but when we actually look at the services that are being provided by a producer's property, we need to be able to stack those. 
And, and to be able to stack them, you need to know what the rest of them are. So things like water quality and water quantity, uh, those are services that are provided by producers all the time. I mean, sometimes they're positive, sometimes they're negative given a producer's management. But uh, as we build organic matter, we know we increase our ability to infiltrate water and, and infiltrate those uh, uh, those aquifers, uh, uh, infiltrate it into the soil, and then through percolation, uh, we, we, we benefit the aquifers of the state of Texas. We also know that uh, if we can in, infiltrate enough water on a big enough landscape, you know, we, we keep some of that water um, back from, you know, it could potentially impact our flood events that happen in, this, in the state. Now, certainly once soils are saturated, they're not, they're, they're saturated, but we can, we can, we can help in that aspect, I think. Um, and, and to be honest with you, as we increase the organic matter in these soils and we begin to infiltrate more soils, we hold more water, the landscapes are greener. Um, we, it changes a lot of things. Sure. Um, water quantity is another, uh, and I've kind of mentioned that as well. But the last one that we haven't quantified really very well is biodiversity. Um, what are the benefits of, of to wildlife habitat by managing these uh, working lands in, in this fashion? Um, and and how, how is that best quantified? And it's a lot of times when we think about wildlife, we'll think about the game species, white-tailed deer, bobwhite quail, morning dove, um, uh, turkeys, uh, but the biodiversity goes well beyond that to invertebrates, to pollinators, to um, uh, a host of other species that all provide positive impacts. You know, we look at, we look at some of the, the species that are in decline in the state and there's a number, but a lot of them are grassland bird species. And, and a lot of that is driven back to uh, management of prairie ecosystems. And so to me, taking all of those and providing a, a structure to be able to, to actually determine what the value is of that, stacking those um, and providing a package for a producer to be able to participate in to, to benefit from, from the management that they're applying outside of the products that they produce uh, or historical perceived products um, to me is a, is a, I think it's the direction we're going. I think we'll eventually get there. I don't think we're there yet, but I, I, I see it. I see a tremendous amount of opportunity and potential in the state of Texas to be able to uh, to capitalize on some of those opportunities. Yeah, I agree with you. I think it's a game changer for us and being able to, you know, again, in that voluntary um, markets and, and things of that nature is, is huge for us. And, and it, for us to get anywhere, we have to be able to stack those services and get paid for multiple, all of these, you know, benefits. And, you know, one thing, Jeff, and um, that TALT has just partnered with um, Texas A&M Natural Resource Institute with Dr. Roel Lopez, and we're tackling some of this challenge is what's the value of these ecosystem services and trying, uh, you know, I think we, we have around 14 ecosystem services that we're looking at that we can actually put a dollar figure for. And so, you know, we're going to try to tackle this at least, you know, it's not going to be perfect, but at least be the first dialogue to say, you know, um, you know, on your properties, these areas, what is that value? Um, you know, there's a similar study. Uh, I know you've probably seen there uh, that's kind of TALT's counterpart in California, the California Rangeland Trust uh, partnered with um, Dr. Huntsinger there in Berkeley and they looked at you know 300,000 acres under easement with the California Rangeland Trust. That was providing $1.44 billion annually to the state of California. You know, that's, that's, that's tremendous, that's a big number. Um, and that's a conservative number because you know, we do have some of these uh, ecosystem services and values that we appreciate as a community, but it's really hard to put a value on it, right? Like open space. You know, we drive and we see open space, we enjoy it. There's, there's definitely uh, mental health. There's all these things benefits from it, but it's hard to put a dollar figure on some of these. So um, I'm excited about it because I think it, it, it furthers the conversation and, and the discussion of the value of these uh, grazing lands and our landscapes as a whole. 
and, and really what private land stewardship means to us as a, as a whole, as a, you know, as a community. Um, and I'm excited about that work and um, looking forward to, to getting that out to everyone. Um, again, Jeff, I appreciate you joining us today and, and uh, just kind of sharing some of the things that, that you're working on, um, what Noble Research Institute is working towards of finding these solutions and um, really appreciate, you know, you joining us. Is there, you know, any other thoughts uh, that you may have before we wrap up? Well, just thanks for having me. Um, and I would just, uh, you know, congratulate you for, sorry about that. Congratulate you for working on, uh, working in the direction that you're working. I, I think uh, providing some documentation or, or, or some, some quantification rather around these ecosystem services is, is really uh, where we're gonna move uh, this whole process forward. We've got, you know, this, we've got generational transfer of landscapes in Texas, and we're gonna continue to be privately owned in this state. And, and, and it's, it's, it's up to us to take care of those, the, the land. It's up to us to understand what it's telling us, to have the ability to read it. And until we, until we know the words, until we uh, can see what it's telling us and, and actually provide the, the, have the understanding and, and understand the value of, of what, it's, uh, what it's providing, I, I think we're, we're, we're having a hard time reading it. So um, again, encourage you to keep, keep up the great work and thanks for having me today. Uh, I appreciate it, Jeff. And you know, more importantly, appreciate our friendship and and uh, then just collaboration and partnership with Noble and Talt, and there's a lot of good things. I mean, we all, as we know, there's a there's a uh, you know a lot of things we need to to figure out and put the pieces together, and we can't do it alone. And it takes a it takes an army. And uh, appreciate appreciate the partnership there. And, and lastly, just want to really thank our listeners for joining us uh, this episode. And really want to kind of build upon this episode on research and kind of where we're going. And next uh, next month, we'll have Dr. Lakeisha Odom with the Foundation for Food Ag Research, uh, which is USDA's foundation, to, to join us. And, and looking forward to, you know, visiting with Lakeisha, Dr. Odom, on some of the research projects that they're working towards. And uh, again, just want to remind everybody to, to be sure to sub subscribe you know, to our podcast so you don't miss an episode and rate and review us because this really helps us find our uh, content and uh, moving, you know, others. And lastly, just want to encourage everybody to go to, to uh, noble.org and uh, go to the website at Noble Research Institute and a lot of great information um, there and uh, appreciate everybody joining and everybody have a blessed one. Thank you. Beyond the Fence Line is brought to you by the Texas Agricultural Land Trust, dedicated to conserving the Texas heritage of agricultural lands, wildlife habitats, and natural resources. Find out more at txaglandtrust.org.